When we think about health, often weight, diet, and exercise are first considerations. In another video, I disentangle weight and health. And in yet another, I make a strong argument for a detente in the war on obesity. Here, I want to turn our focus to what really matters in promoting health. While diet and exercise are two of many factors that matter, even combined, they are not the main determinants of health. In fact, all told, health behaviors account for less than a quarter of differences in health outcomes between groups, according to the Centers for Disease Control and many well-established experts. What is the main determinant? The answer may surprise you. Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Bacon, and as part of my commitment to creating a global transformation that values body respect over body weight, I'm raising awareness about the factors in our culture that undermine our health and well-being. Picture a large corporation with a wide range of job positions and employees drawn from varied backgrounds. The average person at the top of the organization can expect to enjoy better health and live longer than someone in a lower paid job, even if they share identical eating and exercise behaviors. It's a myth that executives are more likely to experience heart attacks than their subordinates. In fact, People lower on the social ladder usually run at least twice the risk of serious illness and premature death as do those near the top. And not only low-income people are affected, even among middle-class office workers, lower-ranking staff suffer more diseases and early death than their bosses. This holds true along the entire economic spectrum. So, while diet and exercise can influence how well we take care of ourselves and how healthy someone is, Social differences actually account for most of society's stark health differences. In the workplace, the gap appears to emerge largely from the job strain of what sociologists call low decision latitude, which refers to lacking a say in how you organize your work. In society at large, the stress of poverty and suffering oppression, discrimination, or marginalization leads to worse health outcomes than those experienced by people afforded greater privilege. In one study, people with intermediate or low job control had over twice the incidence of coronary heart disease as people with high job control. Those well-treated by society, who see themselves as valuable and worthy, who have more control over their lives and in their workplaces, enjoy a protective cushion that trumps the stress they experience. Lives under threat, by contrast, whether due to poverty, childhood trauma, insecure work, noise pollution, damp houses, fear of crime, racism, or sizism, or a general lack of control over one's circumstances, trigger stress responses that work overtime and reduce bodily resilience. It's a toxic combination, even for those who follow all the best lifestyle recommendations. It's also a myth that our genetic code is a strong influencer. In fact, our zip code is a much stronger predictor of how long we'll live than our genetic code. Why do residents of one zip code sometimes live longer than those living a mile away? It's because where you live is about more than just your address. It's about your opportunities and your challenges. Here's how it works. Beyond the general disparity in wealth, people of means have vastly different access to nutritious food, to recreation and schools. For example, in a wealthier neighborhood, there may be farmer's markets, fresher food options and grocery stores, and enticing specialty food shops. The air is cleaner, and there are parks where kids and adults can run and play. There are good public schools and easy access to health care. And if you think living in an impoverished neighborhood and not having access to these things sounds stressful, you're right, which is also bad for your health. Blaming illness on behaviors and weight stops us from addressing the policies and systems that shape our lives in unequitable and unhealthy ways. Most medical and government health recommendations, not to mention innumerable corporate initiatives, ad campaigns, and even reality TV shows, focus on the need for individual change to improve public health. 
when what's really needed is social change if people are to live better and longer. This doesn't mean we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Taking care of ourselves, our body, emotions, relationships, is valuable and a priority. But health behavior and personal resilience are only one part of the picture. Providing education and training for better jobs, investing in our schools and public transportation, caring for the environment, giving people more control over their work, and just treating people with more compassion and respect. These are health-promoting strategies too. And they'll be much more successful than just getting more people exercising, eating well, and avoiding smoking. Now, what does this have to do with my quest to cultivate a culture of body respect? The idea of the healthy body is still typically and relentlessly premised on the need to fight obesity. A movement that reinforces stigma and shame is not a social justice movement nor does it benefit health and well-being. The real crisis lies in the toxic stigma placed on certain bodies and the impact of living with inequity, not the numbers on a scale. The more we stigmatize fatness and glorify thinness, the less we tackle the real problems at the heart of health. Classism, racism, sexism, a corporate structure that profits from our ceaseless dieting and a reluctance to embrace body diversity, accepting and appreciating human bodies in all our wonderful and amazingly different forms, including size, shape, color, gender, physical ability, and more. We need a global transformation that shifts our priorities from body weight to body respect. <laughs>